What's up, Whoa That's Good fam? And welcome back to the Whoa That's Good podcast. That was not. That did not sound like. I me. know that I uh, I rehearsed it better than you did. You panicked. Out. Well, welcome back to the Whoa That's Good podcast, friends and Poot-cast. fam. I did not say. You say Poot-cast. a podcast. <laughs> you did say podcast. Oh my gosh! Why do I keep inviting you back? Anyways. Because your ratings are through the roof on the month. So, <laughs> so you kind of need me. Oh my gosh! Well, if you uh, are not familiar with my special guest today, it is my love husband christian uh, huff welcome back to the podcast babe. thank you it's an honor to be here i think i'm your uh your most invited guest back so. you are thank you it's because when i can't get a guest you always say yes and you can't get enough of me so <laughs> that's true but both are true i'm just kidding i actually intentionally slot you in every now and then so that together we can go through the dms together because it's always fun to answer the DMs with you. Yeah, that's true. You have a lot I, of wisdom. I enjoy answering them with you. You have a lot of wisdom and you have a lot of humor. And that is something the world needs more of. Thank you. When wisdom meets humor, you get excellence. <laughs> Steve that, Jobs said that. No, he did it. <laughs> you can't say <laughs> stuff like that. Okay, anyways, let's go through the DMs. Okay, the I already printed out some of these things. So I'm not looking at my phone because I printed out some things that people DM'd us. Let's just go there. Someone said, where do we go when we die? And follow-up question, are we immediately with Jesus, question mark? And another question within the question of the other question, do you believe in near-death experiences like when person when people claim to have seen Jesus or loved ones? So, go. That's a heavy first question. I know. Well, I, I probably just... wouldn't have been laughing so hard if I knew that that was going to be the first question. Um, well, my first thought is, you know, I think, um, well, obviously we believe that there's a heaven and a hell. So, like, you know, the whole picture, that's what we, you know, believe. But the idea of, like, where do we first go? Um, I really don't know how many references there are in the New Testament. You know, to that specifically, the one that I can think of is, you know, the the thief on the cross with Jesus. And when Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Um, I think that's really our our one yeah. reference point to like what happens right after we die because he says today so yeah um so and i don't there's know there's also so much about like god's preparing a home for us yeah and the word so is it ready or is it being prepared or what does that look like um so yeah i mean the theologically speaking we are not like scholars and we don't know the answer to that i mean um, you know, even the Lord says, like, no one knows the time or the place that, like, Jesus will come back and when that's going to take place. But as far as, like, when you die, I mean, yeah, we do believe that there's a heaven and a hell. And I actually heard Jordan B. Peterson say something about that. He was like, if you actually believe there's a heaven and a hell, that should change everything about the way that you'll live. Mm-hmm. That's so true. I mean, if we really believe that Jesus is a savior of our life from hell on earth and eternal hell— for a heaven, and that should change everything about the way that we live our life. Like, we should be eager to tell people that and tell people that in a loving way, but a serious, truthful way. And so I like to remind myself that that's what I believe Mm -hmm. because I do believe that um, for sure. And do I believe in near-death experiences where people meet Jesus? I do. I have no reason not to believe that. I mean, I feel like um, people's stories, I don't know if you've ever read Heaven is for Real. I know we read it and it blew my mind. Sorry. Imagine heaven, but, but heaven, heaven and for real is yeah. also one of one of those. The heaven is for real story is also in Imagine Heaven, but Imagine Heaven is a um, series of different people who have um, had near the experiences and you know saw Jesus or had a um, moment of seeing heaven or seeing old loved ones, and it was so cool because what they did in um, Imagine heaven, why do I keep getting this too mixed up? Is they reference all of it with scripture references. So all these like scripture references about heaven, um, they lined it up with what people said they experienced. So, I mean, I don't see why not. I think God is so big. If God wants to reveal that to people, then that's awesome. And if he doesn't reveal it to other people, then that's his will. And so I definitely think that that's true. Um, I mean, you see some people and hear about people dying and seeing Jesus, and then they come back and it changed everything about the way that they live. Mm-hmm. So like I said, like if you actually believe that and if you actually experienced that or knew that that was true, I think you would live a lot differently. So I think it's good to ask yourself the question too, like where do you think you go when you die? Where do you think you will go? Um, are you in need of an eternal Savior who's Jesus? 
or you know do you did you have a near-death experience what was that like um does that change a little bit about the way that you think about life so yeah heavy hitter it's a heavy hitter this is why you gotta check your dms every now and then yeah well even going back you know to the first thing there are you know scriptures where it talks about a new heaven and a new earth and it says that we'll be you know our bodies will be um you know, I can't think of what the word is, but like we'll be reconnected, I guess, with our physical bodies, something like that. But I don't know. This is oh, no, very... get. I think we get new heavenly bodies. Well, we do, but I'm saying like, but there, I think it does make a distinction between like the spiritual and like, the physical. like we get like re, like a new body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. All this to say, obviously we don't know all the answers to that. I think we'd have to dig in the Bible. But as far as the overall answer, we're very confident in our belief of, yes, there is a heaven and a hell. We believe we're going to heaven because we've been saved by Christ. And um, we also believe that near the experiences are real. So, yeah, for sure. anyways. All right. Let's keep going. That, that was a heavy one. That, let's see if there's anything a little bit lighter. But, you know, honestly, as I was going through these, there's a lot of serious questions, um, which I think is good because, hey, we got to talk about this stuff and we can't shy away from it. All right. Let's see. I'm not seeing any lighter options. <laughs> so let's just go straight in. Someone said, is it good to take a break in your relationship for a week or so to discern separately with God about if you want to get married to this person? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you think about it, if that's going to be the person that you marry, you know, taking a week off comparatively to 40, 50 years, I mean, that it's not a lot of time if you think about spending forever with somebody. So I think it's definitely smart to take time to discern those things through prayer and also just, yeah, asking the Lord to reveal um, what that relationship is going to, you know, ultimately unfold to look like. Does he or she make you a better person and um, all those different things. But I think yeah. if you look at it, like, because in the moment, uh, taking a week off seems like a while. Like, it'd be like, I'm not going to talk to you for a week. That sounds like kind of daunting. But if you think about it. Everything's dramatic when you're yeah, dating. Yeah, but if you think about it in comparison to, like, potentially 20, 30, 40 years with somebody, then a week does not sound like that long yeah well we did that yeah we took a couple days because i was like i really need to sit with the lord and like discern is this really who i want to marry and i know it's funny telling you like you know that but it's funny talking about that but christian had um christian and i had had this big like argument and it was our first and big argument and then it kind of like freaked me out like oh gosh like is this right but um matt chandler said this in mingling of souls he said, you're going to argue with someone, figure out who you want to argue with, which is good advice. And so it wasn't that I was scared because we were arguing, because I think arguing is a good thing. Someone also asked us in here, uh, how do you avoid arguments? I don't think you should avoid arguments. I think you should have arguments because arguments lead you to a better place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, more of a mutual understanding of each other. And um, so I don't think it's bad to have an argument, but it just scared me, you know? And so it took three days and we didn't talk. And I just really sat with the Lord. And I remember I prayer walked actually where we live now, which is kind of cool. And I prayer walked it and prayed and asked the Lord for wisdom. And is this, is this going to be my guy? Cause I mean, if you weren't going to be my husband, then to me, it wasn't worth staying in this relationship where it was about to get hard. But if you were, then it would be what you were going to, you were going to cut me off. I mean, I didn't want, I just wanted to know, like I wanted to seek the Lord because that's something I didn't do in other relationships. I just, you know, trailblazed through it instead of being like, God, is this what you have for me? So Mm -hmm. I stopped and I paused, and I, you were nervous. I was, yeah. Sadie was praying, uh, is this the man for me? And I was praying, please don't break up with me. Hey, friends, just want to tell you about my wonderful experience with Stitch Fix. If you've never heard of it, Stitch Fix is a service that allows you to basically have your own personal stylist that accommodates your tastes and preferences. Through taking a quick quiz, they will determine what you love and even down to the favorite colors that you have, the way that you like to fit your clothes on you, and a comfortable price point to set up your own Stitch Fix profile. I know sometimes I prefer a little bit of a looser fit and Stitch Fix makes all of those details so simple. After that, their stylist will do all the work to find items chosen just for you. I've loved mine so far. As a mom, I also want to be cute and trendy, but without the time to browse and search the internet for everything, the seasonal life Stitch Fix allows me to enjoy fashion without the time commitment. It's super easy and you can schedule your fix with five styles, hand selected 
perspective for you without even having to subscribe, which that's great. I love the opportunity to shop through and keep what I love and actually easily return what doesn't work for me. So don't let this busy season keep you from missing out on cute clothes that are cute and feel perfect just for you. So whether you need to go on a great date and you need an outfit for that or just some loungewear, Stitch Fix has got you covered. So make sure to check it out and get all the latest finds for women, men, and kids. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash woe to get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash woe to get $20 off your first purchase. And take advantage of this limited time offer and purchase within two days of sign up. I remember though, I remember though, this was so good for me. I got before the Lord and I loved you. I really did. And I'd already told you I loved you. I knew I loved you. Like mm-hmm. I really did love you. And I told the Lord, God, I love this man, but I love you more. And so if this is something I need to surrender, I will. And that was actually a really scary prayer for me. Like I really was nervous that it was going to be a no and I was going to have to break up with you because I actually did love you. Mm -hmm. But I needed to know that confirmation from God because I didn't want to walk into a relationship that was going to separate or make me and God's relationship like, you know, just more distant. I wanted it to only make it closer. Mm -hmm. And when it's the wrong person, you go away from God. When Mm -hmm. it's the right person, you go to God. And you can also be with the right person and go away from God if y'all aren't living for the Lord. But I just want to know, like, is this the guy that we're about to, like, do this thing with? And you were. And after that, I didn't have any doubts about a relationship ever again. And I knew that I didn't because I'd already got my yes from God. I already knew that I was willing to surrender it, even if that meant losing you who I loved. And so that was a really good thing for me. So I would say like, yes, take the time, ask the Lord, seek his guidance, because if you do, it'll probably save you from like doubts in the future as you head towards that. Mm -hmm. Um, So someone also asked when it comes to marriage and stuff or getting married or dating engagement, they said, how do you set healthy physical boundaries when you know you want to get married, but it's not time yet or you're too young? One couple says that they know they want to get married and because they are struggling to keep healthy physical boundaries before marriage, they're not sure what to do. And another couple says they feel too young because they're also not sure what the fix would be. Um, So these are people who are 18 and 19 years old. I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot to this. I mean, we can only give you advice from afar. I would say, first of all, like seek your like local mentors, your mom, your dad, your friends, people around you. Um, But I mean, as far as physical boundaries, I'll say this. I know when you're dating, that seems like it is everything, you know, and you're just like, oh, I just want to get married so that we can have sex or whatever. Mm -hmm. Marriage is so much bigger than sex. It Mm -hmm. just is. I mean, that's a beautiful aspect of marriage that God created within that. And trust me, it's beautiful within the boundaries of marriage. It's like Adam and Eve when they were naked and they felt no shame. It's it's that feeling of like, I feel no shame as opposed to premarital sex. Like there's so much shame. So I would just encourage you like, you know, anytime you open that before it's meant to be open, there tends to be shame, Mm -hmm. guilt, um, insecurity, self-doubt, all this stuff. But within marriage, we found that to be a beautiful gift. And so it's definitely, definitely worth the wait. And you'll see why it's intended for marriage. It's intended for two becoming one. And um, God's design in that was beautiful. So how do you wait? I think you just desire that, like desire God's plan. And the one thing Christian and I said all the time was we want your plan, God, not our own. We want to see your plan come to life in our relationship. And part of that was waiting to have sex until we were married. So yes, it feels like a huge deal. And you're like, oh, I just want to get married. I just want to get married. But just wait, friends. I mean, do what you got to do. Have the conversations. Talk about it. Have friends in your life, mentors who keep you accountable. um, And truly wait for that because it really is worth it. And if you've already had sex before, you're not alone. We had both had past before we met each other that were not totally pure and then meeting each other we decided we wanted to pursue purity together Mm -hmm. and so we did we still messed up at times in our relationship but we were on the path of purity and we were so grateful that we did and so that's kind of like my advice um if you're you know young or you have to wait for some reason it's Mm -hmm. still worth the wait and i would say too that um you know i mean 
a lot of people get married young and I don't think that it's a bad thing to get married young if you know that you know that you know that's your person and um, you know you've taken the time to seek that from God your parents you know agree your your pastors are for you you have people around you like my siblings got married at 18 and 19 and they have great marriages my parents got married at 18 19 Mm -hmm. they have great marriages i think ultimately what keeps a marriage strong is just like your commitment to the lord and if you are in union with him but i don't know christian what do you think yeah well i was gonna say i think too like you know if you're feeling pressured in that area i think that there are also like external factors that can like influence that Mm -hmm. so to speak so like if you're you know scrolling on social media and like you're you're not like doing things like that are bad necessarily but like like externally but like internally you're like you know there's like lust in your heart there's Mm -hmm. these different things and like i feel like you can sometimes take that into a relationship and put this expectation on the other person to where it's like if you cut off these things that can make you um you know lustful or, or can make you feel like you need to do something then you can put that on the person that you're dating with so i think that there are things outside of the relationship that you can cut off that you can limit that you can try to decrease that can that can influence that because i know that if i like you know if we were dating and i followed people that you know or i was scrolling through things that like made me feel a certain way i feel like i would have a tougher time being it's like if you're watching pornography on your private time and then you're in a relationship trying to keep pure boundaries like it's not gonna it's not gonna work because what your inside like what you have been storing inside i remember christian you had quit watching pornography for a good bit before we started dating Uh and you were really pursuing the lord and i remember you like prayed a lot like really prayed a lot because you were like okay obviously tempted because you were in love And you had a past of like watching things, but you weren't going to go back to that and you weren't going to cross the boundary with me. So that led you to prayer. And I think a lot of people excuse themselves Mm -hmm. um, during that time of like, well, I'm not doing this. so I'll watch this or I'm not doing this. But it's not just about sex. That's not what keeps you pure. Like purity is like a heart posture, you know. And so to have a pure heart. You got to pray because mm-hmm. that's sure. something from the Lord. For sure. And and I think one of my mentors even said too, like if, if, if you're dating, like all the enemy wants to do is get you to have sex. And then you get married, then this, he switches playing fields. Then it's like when you get married, all he wants to do is keep you from having sex. Yeah. So it's like either way, you're always going to walk through something that is counter to what, to what you truly desire, so that's to speak, true. you know? And so like, why think, would the enemy want that? Because it's a powerful thing that God designed. Yeah. You know, well, it meant creates, for it to it people to intimacy. become one. Yeah. yeah. So like he's going to, when you're dating, the playing field is get you to fall into this temptation. Then you get married, then you're in covenant. And then the playing field switches to like keep you from having intimacy. So like mm-hmm. there, he's very strategic and there's, he's, there's, he's going to put obstacles. He's going to put things in place, but you have to like, yeah, through prayer, through worship, through reading, through um, confession, through a community, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a fight where it's it's a struggle, it's a thing that you go through, but like, mm-hmm. you know, you have to have you have to persevere. And yep. I think that the enemy is very yep. very crafty and this always going to be things that you yep. have to combat. And then on this note, they didn't ask this, but this is bonus this is a bonus question bonus. that I'm going to ask. Because whenever, you know, we started dating, uh, you see I'll say this. Whenever I was in other relationships, I would like look through guys that I'm dating, like social media, and I would see they're following girls that like posted some inappropriate stuff. In my opinion, it was too far. And I didn't want my boyfriend to be looking at another girl's body like that. And so I would ask them to unfollow these people. Um, so they would or whatnot. Well, whenever I started dating you, that was not a problem because you were like following a really small amount of people, but that hadn't always been your story. You know, that hadn't always been what your social media looked like. Um, do you think it's a fair thing for a girl to ask a guy to unfollow girls that are not posting appropriate things? And for you as a guy, do you think y'all should take that on your responsibility to go ahead and clean that out? Like, do you think that's actually a real struggle for people if you're if you're following girls on social media? And what do you think, like, you know, the boundary should be for yourself? Yeah, I do think so. I think I think first there should maybe be um, like a conversation about it because 
one of the people that could be posting that could be somebody's cousin or something like that. And then it's like, you know, then it's an awkward thing of like, you know, you unfollow their cousin, then it's like, you know, whatever. But I do think that, you know, I do think that guys should take liberty of like, you know, what you're looking at, it's going to influence, you know, certain things in your life. And if you're following these accounts where people post, you know, inappropriate things or skimpy things or whatever, then that can influence and that can put toxic thoughts into a relationship that you're trying to pursue with purity. So I do think that guys should take it upon themselves to um, guard your heart to guard your heart and to unfollow things that need to be unfollowed and, and, and yada, yada, yada. But I do think that, that a girl should have the right to like, yeah, I mean, maybe if it's a one month in a dating, that's different. But like if you're yeah. about to be getting engaged and talking about being – talk about marriage, you know, if there are a bunch of yeah people that you follow that are – you know, that you don't really want him following, I do think that you can have a conversation. Yeah. But I think maybe not being like – unfollow this person maybe like why do you follow this person and then yeah. you have a conversation about have it have a conversation yeah like what's your like yeah. why do you follow this person or like what's yeah. your what's your motive here and then from that you have a conversation and that can lead to unfollow or actually that's my cousin or you know something like that i don't know just a thought All right, fam, got to tell you more about our mattress from Helix Sleep. When Christian and I got ready to shop, we knew Helix was the right choice because taking their simple two-minute quiz together allowed us to have both of our input and personal preference into picking our perfect mattress for us. Helix recognizes that everyone's sleeping needs are a little bit different and very personal, and a mattress should be too. So they have soft, medium, firm mattresses, even mattresses that could keep you cool or support spinal alignment. When we took their quiz, I was matched with the Helix Midnight because I wanted a mattress that was not too soft and not too firm. I'm also a side sleeper and I feel so good waking up now because they even care about that. No aches or pains or sleepless nights. It's been such a huge improvement. It's still soft, but also really supportive. Plus it keeps Christian and Cabo happy too. And I'm sure Honey likes it just as well when she gets in bed with this. If you're on the hunt for a new mattress, don't wait for another minute. Just take the quiz right now and the Helix mattress comes right to your door. Ship for free. No awkward mattress store shopping needed. In fact, fact, you don't even have to take my word for it because Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by Wire Magazine and others and has even been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improved sleep. All you have to do is go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie, take their two-minute quiz, and they will match you with the best customized option for you. So get ready for the best sleep of your life. They will even give you a trial period of 100 nights risk-free. And this is the best part. For some reason you don't love it, they'll actually pick it up for you. It's so easy, but I truly think that you will love it. So right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Sadie. That's helixsleep.com slash Sadie for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Okay, what about movies? Because we had a situation the other day where, okay, first of all, Christian is a movie guy. He loves movies. He watched, like, a movie every night in high school. and uh, Yeah, college. Yeah. College. And I'm, like, not yeah, a movie cool. person as much. I'm very much, like, guard your heart, guard your soul, guard your mind. So I'm pretty picky with, like, what I watch. That is not – that was not something my parents put on me. That was not something I was – that's just something I personally like to do. So Christian will be like, hey, I'm going to see this movie. I just enjoy – I enjoy good cinema. Yeah, and I'll be like, hold on. Let me check parents' guide. Not trying to be his mom or anything, but I'm trying to help Christian guard his heart. But also it's up to him to guard his heart. So sometimes like we have this thing of like, you know, I need to let him make decisions for himself. But then there are other times where I feel like I'm allowed to step in and say, okay, that's too far. You're not going to go see that because that literally has nudity and you don't need to go see another woman's body but where do you personally for from a movie guy like you're a movie guy but you love the lord how do you find that balance in like what you choose to watch well here's the thing that was just a rare case where that happened i had seen the trailer and i was like that looks like a good movie i'm gonna ask your dad if he wants to go see it because he told me he wanted to see it i hadn't looked at any of the parental (laughs) guide but i'm very i mean i'm very like cautious i'm very sensitive to spiritual things like that like Mm -hmm. i'm not just you know i feel like this person that can watch this and not feel any conviction or any like inkling Mm -hmm. in my spirit of like maybe maybe i shouldn't be watching this Mm -hmm. so i very i am very guarded and very careful with like what i watch what i take Mm -hmm. in because i do think that for me personally that can influence sinful things in my life exactly um and that's why it's important you know because to me i'm like 
I'm not trying to be over here being like a goody two shoes. Like, yeah, no. oh, you need to watch this. You don't need to watch this. Don't listen to bad music. Don't... The only reason why I don't watch bad shows or I don't listen to bad music or whatever, and bad is in toxic as far as like maybe it's sexual, maybe it's lustful, maybe it has a lot of cussing, maybe it has a lot of anger, maybe it has a lot of violence. Maybe... Because that like whatever I put into my heart is what comes out of my heart. So I've noticed like if I'm watching something that has bad language, I like get more, you know, tempted to let some words fly or if I'm watching something that has a lot of violence or I get super fearful and that triggers anxiety or if I'm watching something that's lustful or whatever it that creates lust and so I if I don't want it in my mind I don't put it in my mind it's not like I'm yeah. like oh I'm trying to be a rule follower there's yeah. no rules it's just that's what it looks like for me to guard my heart yeah. because I don't want the effects of what sin does when it takes root yeah but I will say there's there has been a moment where I'm like you know, I'm going to like try to like sneak this one by you. Kind of thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. like it was you like, you would never get by. No, it was like an, on, it was like an open, like, I want to see this movie. So oh, like, yeah. Cause yeah, I saw yeah. the trailer. Then you were like, actually, this has a lot of nudity. Like, if mm-hmm. I would not go into a theater or go watch a movie knowing that there was going to be a lot of nudity because one, I wouldn't want to see that. And two, I just know me personally, that's not healthy for me. Exactly. Um, but yeah, they would, I wouldn't. Like, cause I think that's, I think that gets to the point of like, if you're in a relationship and like, you're trying to like be sneaky or be like, you know, I'm going to see this movie and then you go see this movie to mm-hmm. like, co- like conceal something. Then I think that's when that gets dangerous and messy and all those things. That's so true. Good answer. But babe. I do enjoy good cinema. That's right. Ones that don't have nudity. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Um, what do you do when your people in quotes, are toxic people. How do we know when it's time to walk away from a friendship or when it's time to push through the heart and fight for the relationship? It's a great question. I've been in situations like this where, like I mentioned, there are some, like, you're going to argue with everyone. Or arguing's not bad. Um, so, yeah, like, there are some relationships that you're going to argue with, or you're going to have hard things with, but they're worth the fight. Like, they're worth the relationship because because you love them, because they draw you closer to Jesus, because you draw them closer, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But there has been relationships in my past where, you know, it was a toxic relationship and it was one that I knew I needed to walk away from. And really that, that I typically know when it's time is when I look at myself and I'm a really unhealthy version of myself or friends around me are saying, hey, that's not a good relationship. Or whenever I see you with them, I see you way more insecure. I see you hurt. I see you broken. I see all these things. Um, And so, yeah, I think you really have to listen to the spirit on that one. I think you have to listen to your friends, listen to people around you, ask Mm -hmm. advice. Like, hey, like, do you think this is a healthy relationship or not to to friends around you, not to that person? Because, of course, they're not going to be able to give you a wise answer. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's a heart check moment. And uh, like I said, I've had best friends of mine who we've had some really tough conversations and yet we're still super close friends and it's fine all is forgiven in the past both of us have messed up whatever it is but then I've had other relationships where it just was toxic and I think I think that word toxic is the difference even in the hardest of my relationships with Christian or best friends of mine I would never call it toxic you know I would say hard or this is a bad situation but I never say it's toxic when a relationship is toxic which means like all of it is bad it is spoiled it is rotten like that's probably the time that you should you should start to step away yeah you just took the words out of my mouth well I was gonna say because it's in the it's in this it's in the question you know toxic like there's a difference between walking through something that's difficult and like having arguments versus something that's toxic and I think that even the word toxic, like if something is bad and you're trying to convince yourself that it's not bad, that's when it's toxic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so if someone is not being encouraging or uplifting, it's, if it's constantly slander or envy or jealousy or, you know, all these things and it's just degrading and it's just not healthy, then that's when you know it's toxic. Because if you're trying to convince yourself, oh, it's not that bad, then it's probably, it's probably bad. So. Yep. I agree. All right. This is a great question. Do you have any thoughts on people claiming that the Bible is outdated? Here's some things that people have said. One person says that they had a discussion with a friend and they both agreed that the Bible supports the idea that men should pursue women. And her friend said she believes things have changed and the Bible is outdated. Another person, I've also been taught to do and believe what the word of God says and that it's timeless and applicable to all generations to come. Um, Does the Bible restrict that? Well, we won't even go into that yet. I won't even go into that next question. Basically, do we believe that the Bible is outdated? 
I do not personally believe that the Bible has edited. I, I feel like the Bible is so like, it, it's actually crazy. It's one of my favorite parts about the Bible is that it was thousands and thousands of years ago that it was written. I mean, 2000 years ago since Jesus, but thousands of years ago since the beginning. I mean, since really the beginning of Abraham and all them. Um, and yet it's still so applicable to what we go through today. Mm-hmm. Like all of the things are true. Like if you if you live by the principles of Jesus, like you would be an amazing, amazing person. Back to what Jordan B. Peterson, another quote that he said, as he said, you know, I, be- I live as though I believe the Bible's true because he's like, that's a great way to live. I mean, some of the commands of Jesus, like love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Like love people. Mm-hmm. The, other, the golden rule where it says um, how we should treat people, uh, doing to others as you want them to do unto you. Mm-hmm. That's a great rule we still apply by. I mean, the Ten Commandments are in our courthouse. Like there's so much in the Bible that we still live out, and that's still true. I think Jesus and the relationship he had with his people, you can learn so much from them. I preach so much on messages from like Peter or Paul or um, even in the Old Testament, like mm-hmm. Adam and Eve and um, all these things. And yet like still to this day, people will cry being like so shocked about how much they relate to these stories and how relatable the love of God is. So I love that the Bible is so timely and it's timeless. Yeah. Um, the word of God, God in and of himself, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's yes and amen. He is all these things and his word is too. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I mean, the word yeah. is the word and it yeah. will be the word forever. And that is a really amazing thing because we live in a world where everything changes and the word of God stays the same. And it's one of the most popular, well-known Things that has ever, I think probably the most popular, well-known story of all time is the message of Jesus. And I think that's because it doesn't change. After Honey goes to bed, it is our favorite thing for Christian and I to just catch up about the day. And of course, we have to have a snack every now and then. And our favorite go-to snack is a bowl of cereal. It's just the ultimate bedtime snack, but I still want to eat clean, you know? And so that's why I cannot rave enough about Magic Spoon. If you haven't heard of it, Magic Spoon is a brand dedicated to helping us all relive our best childhood memories without sacrificing our health. Although it is delicious, Magic Spoon actually has zero grams of sugar. And with the Honey Nut flavor only containing one gram of sugar, it has 13 to 14 grams of protein and only 4 net grams of carbs in each serving. In fact, there are only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, soy-free, grain-free, and low-carb, which makes it also guilt-free, hey-yo, despite the awesome variety of flavors to choose from. Not only do Christian and I love it, but I also feel great about being able to give it to Honey, too, which is great because she is all about snacks these days. She loves her some snacks. So the way that it works is you can build your own box. Available flavors to build your custom bundle are Cocoa Frosted fruity peanut butter cookies and cream maple waffle blueberry cinnamon plus the newly reformulated honey nut flavor that would be added to magic spoons permanent collection it tastes delicious which is why they brought it back permanently and not gonna lie i'm getting hungry right now i'm gonna need me some cereal tonight it's super easy to get your first box just go to magicspoon.com slash woe to grab a custom bundle of cereal and be sure to use our promo code woe at checkout and save five dollars off your order and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they'll refund your money back no questions asked remember get your next bowl of delicious guilt-free cereal on magicspoon.com slash woe and use our code woe to save five dollars off at checkout yeah i definitely yeah i definitely don't think the bible's outdated and i had like i've heard a lot of arguments for why they people think it's outdated but i've never heard because of a man pursuing a woman. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, not to like throw shade or anything, but I'm like, out of all the things in the Bible, like... <laughs> well, there's people definitely claim, things in yeah. the Bible that as far as like, yeah, there are things in the Bible that are specific to that culture and time. Yeah. But as far as like the the word and the story and the message and the commandments, like none of that. No, yeah. I don't think but, really. But I don't think in the Bible it ever says that a woman shouldn't pursue a man. I think that like, obviously, yes... A man, I believe, should pursue a woman, but I, that that does not mean that a woman can't pursue a man, um, because I would argue that, by and large, and highly percentage of of a woman that does end up pursuing a man, would not mind if they were ever pursued by a man. Mm-hmm. You know, I always say I think that men should pursue women. I really do, and I think I think that 
even the story of the Bible, it, it does talk about that a lot. Like the, I don't think it's bad, but I think that traditionally, and also just with the way that women feel loved and that men feel want to feel respected and all that, I think the leadership aspect is awesome. So you do see a lot of that. Even how it says, like, we are the bride of Christ. Like, mm-hmm. God is, like, you know, pursuing us. Like, he's going to come back for us yeah. to get us. But I will say this. I think that a man should pursue a woman, but I do think that a woman should make a man confident to pursue them. And what I mean by that is I don't think it's all up to the man. I think the woman has a lot to play in the confidence of a man being able to pursue them. I don't like when a woman's like, oh, well, they haven't done this. Well, help them. Like, you know, like, and like, text them back if you don't text them back then yeah then that's not their fault for how yeah. they pursued you well there you know? is a difference between like pursuing and like taking initiative like yeah i don't think a like a woman can say hey would you want to go get coffee oh, for like, sure. yeah, but for there's sure. a difference between like just taking initiative in a relationship and like pursuing like making the dates driving the drive like the woman yeah. in the driver's seat and the whole relationship kind of falls on them. I think that's a different thing. Yeah, than just taking an issue. I agree. Yeah, I because, think there's a difference. Yeah, in the because two. like you said, by and large, men want to be respected. And if the woman is the one that's calling all the shots, making all the plans, mm-hmm. like I feel like in the long term, that can maybe be not beneficial. So true. But I do think there's a difference between yeah. a woman pursuing and a woman taking initiative. I think a woman can definitely take initiative. So true. So. And I think too, like as far as the Bible, like if you went and you read the Old Testament right now, you'd be like, well, there's a lot of things that are outdated. Well, yes. But the New Testament is there for a reason that Jesus came and like he like it's a new law. Like it's a new it's like we are saved by grace, you know, so we don't have to do all those things that used to in the Old Testament. It said they have to do because Jesus has come. And now our um, relationship with God is not as complicated as back in the Old Testament. So don't pick up your Bible and say, well, Sadie, have you read Leviticus? It's pretty outdated. No, no, no. I'm talking about like the message of the gospel like mm-hmm. Jesus. Um, New Testament included. Um, Okay, so speaking on New Testament, last question. Of course we get the question we get asked all the time. Can you talk about your beliefs on women's roles in the church? Something I've been struggling with in the scripture as far as um, offices that can be held, etc. Okay, so women in the church, women speaking in the church, all around women in the church. Listen, go read the New Testament. You will be shocked, friends, how much Jesus was for women, loved women, encouraged women, worked with women, literally preached alongside of women. Not that women were preaching, but Mary Magdalene was a huge part of his ministry. Um, The very first person that he really sat there and claimed to be the Messiah to was the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And then what did he tell her? Go and tell your story. So then the woman went and told her story, her testimony, which is preaching. And then it says that that whole town came to know Jesus. So the first preacher was really a woman, you know, from launched out of Jesus's personal time with him, understand he's Messiah. The first person to go out and tell it was a woman. And so we have so many women, even in Paul, there's a moment in Paul in Philippians uh, four, I think four, two, and Paul's correcting two women who are alongside of him in his ministry. And he's saying, Hey women, get it together. Stop arguing. We got a, we got a gospel to preach. Therefore insinuating that there are two women who are part of this ministry. So there's a a lot of women in the word. I mean, the, the first two people who saw Jesus tomb rolled away, who ran and told everybody, women, you know, mm-hmm. Mary. And they went and told everyone that, hey, like he's risen. He's not here. Meet us at the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus was like not prejudiced towards women at all. I think, okay, so where that comes from is there's a moment where Paul is writing to a church, a letter to the church, and he says, tell the women to be silent in the church. So um, what I have learned from going to Israel and understanding the biblical context of that is back in the day, the way that the churches were set up is all the men sat in the front and all the women sat in the back of the church. So there would be somebody talking and the women would be in the back. Well, the women would be crying out like to hear the person. They were very loud. They were very vocal. They were wanting to hear what the person was saying. And it was distracting. Like the women were simply distracting people because of where they were sitting and how they were crying out and it was distracting all the men. So Paul said, hey, tell the women to be silent in the church. So it wasn't that he was saying, women don't need to preach in the church. Women cannot be a part of the church. It was just that, hey, like stop being a distraction because a lot of the letters 
Not that they are, you know, timing out, but they were specific to the churches that he was writing the letter to of Paul. So in the New Testament, like Corinthians, like Paul is writing a letter to the church of Corinth, like Ephesians, same thing, like all these different ones. Uh, uh, He's writing a letter to Ephesus, isn't it? And so it's like, yes, there are specific things to the churches that he was at. Now, also, we are taught just like the whole man leading thing is that, yeah, like men are supposed to be the leader. We are supposed to be in submission to men, Um, just like God made Adam and then like created a suitable helper. Mm -hmm. So do I think women should be the only leaders in the church? No, I think men should lead in the church as well. And I think men should be leading a church. I think women should come right alongside and help that and whatever gifting that they have to help. Now, if that looks like in the nursery, that's great. If that looks like, you know, uh, passing out coffee, that's great. If it looks like leading worship, that's great. And if it looks like teaching, if that's their gift, that's great. For me, I have like been given a gift of communication and I'm a strong Christian. And so I put the two and two together and I use my communication to honor Christ. I don't see how any way, shape or form that could be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, I don't feel convicted. I don't feel like I shouldn't be doing it. I feel like I'm doing what God's called me to do. And so that's where I stand on it. Um, Obviously, People are going to have opinion, but I would like to encourage you, friends, if you're going to have an opinion, first do the research and yeah. first really study the word before you go and just take a verse and use it, you know, out of context. Yeah, yeah I don't have too much to say about it. I think I think you did a really well, a really good job. Um, all I'll say is that I think it's a secondary issue. And if you spend all your time spinning your wheels about should a woman be, should a woman be speaking, should a woman be in office? then I would just argue that you have bigger things to worry about. I mean, seriously, I mean, how I awesome. I think you're being in a pretty ineffective if if that's consuming you. Like, yes. it's kind of trivial. I mean. What a great strategy for the devil to use yeah. than to let the church argue about the things in the church and not just focus on the main thing. Now, there are things that we need to correct. Obviously, Paul is writing letters to all the churches saying, this is what you need to do better, this is what you need to do better. So there's room for correction. There's room for learning. Absolutely. But when you read the life of Jesus and how he empowered women and how he like encouraged women to go and to tell and to do all this, it's like, then why are we, who are we to judge? Like yeah. if a woman's preaching and they're right on the word. Mm-hmm. See, I can be out there. I'm preaching the gospel. Like Jesus came, he died, he rose again to sin for our sin. Stop living your sinful life. Turn from your sins. Repent. Be baptized into Christ. Like the gospel as a whole. And it could be like the best, most accurate biblical um, <laughs> teaching you've heard. And someone could still sit there and say, eh, women shouldn't preach in the church. Just what I'm saying, if, that, like, if that fires somebody up, that's then, it. then you need to go check yourself. Check your heart, yeah. I think you have a bigger issue. So, Man, the DMs got us fired up today. This is why you should read your DMs and why you shouldn't. It gets me so fired up. Get somebody to read your DMs for you. Well, friends, um, thank you all for asking hard questions. You know, honestly, like I said at the beginning, you can't shy away from these questions. These are real questions. These are There's no shame for anyone asking that question about women speaking in the church. Understand, it is a confusing thing. There's no shame for people asking the hard questions about sex before marriage and all of that. Th- these things need to be talked about. And I don't like sometimes how the church shies away from the hard conversation. Like, I think we need to be right in the mix of them because we have a book of truth, right? We have a book of direction. And so therefore, we should not be ashamed or afraid to ask questions when we have a book of direction and truth. Um, Literally in the word, it says um, that God will make our path straight, that he's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. That's what the word of God does for us. And so we need to be able to use that to, you know, bring truth to our lives. And so Christian, thank you for being on my podcast yet again. Thank you for asking me to be on. Now I'm reminded as to why I ask you back, even though you annoy me with the Thank microphone you. before we start. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, all, all your annoyances are pre-start, so. I know. I can be better. At that. And I can get less annoyed. <laughs> Love you. Love you guys. Thanks for listening in and keep DMing us so we can have a great podcast next time I have Christian on. Bye, don't.